Good afternoon and, and thank you for joining this uh, webinar with uh, Lloyd's uh, Banking Group. I've just put a, a poll up on screen asking uh, if you're a shareholder in Lloyd's and I would ask you just to complete that poll while we're waiting for everyone to arrive. Um, and then shortly Cliff Waite, a director of ShareSoc, is going to give an introduction to the webinar. But we'll just wait um, a few moments for people to arrive and to complete that poll and then I'll hand over to, to Cliff. As people are completing that poll, it looks like we've got about 75% of people attending today are uh, our shareholders uh, in Lloyd's. So a good proportion of shareholders, but uh, about 25% of people are, um, are non-shareholders currently. Potentials. I'm going to leave that poll up on screen, but Cliff, would you like to uh, uh, start with your introduction? Okay, um, next slide then, please. Uh, thank you all for attending this session. Um, we're very pleased to have this again with Lloyds Bank. Last year we're physical and now this year uh, we're virtual. Um, second best, but nevertheless very important. And we start with our usual warranty. Um, you should take your own professional advice. ShareSock is not an organisation which gives financial advice. Uh, next slide, please. For those of you who don't know ShareSock, um, we are a not-for-profit organisation. We have uh, about 6,000 members. We're growing quite rapidly. Um, and we do four things, really. We campaign um, uh, on behalf of shareholders to government and, and to companies when necessary. Um, Lloyd's is not necessary for us to campaign against. Um, we're, we inform, um, we have the webinars like this, we have our monthly newsletter and we have various blogs. Uh, we educate. If you haven't looked at the Investor Academy, please have a quick look. And we do lots of masterclasses. Um, and we create networking op opportunities. And after this, there is a, net, a signet opportunity. These are serious investing groups, uh, which now meet virtually. Um, so we try to improve your investing experience. So next slide then, please. Uh, just a technical point. We are, we're having questions and answers today. Um, we've disabled the raising hands in the chat, I think. Um, so if you want to ask a question, type it in the questions and answer box. Um, and we've had quite a few pre-submitted questions as well, so uh, that'd be interesting. Um, and you've also uh, been sent in your email. Um, if you go back, you'll find it. There's a link to the Stockopedia report, um, which is, it's, has lots of interesting facts about, about that, um, which I, I've been studying myself. And um, we will send you the presentation pack afterwards. So without further ado, um, I shall hand over to Carla and Douglas. Thank you very much. Um, Doug, if you would now uh, unmute yourselves and we'll hand over to you. Right, good, good morning, everyone. And um, thank you for joining our ShareSock uh, webinar today. Um, hopefully I think we should just be putting up um, uh, some Lloyd slides as well. So hopefully those will arrive in a second. Uh, but whilst those are being put up, um, just as a bit of background. So I am Douglas Radcliffe and I'm the Group Investor Relations Director at Lloyd's Banking Group. Also here with me today um, is Carla Antun de Silva. Um, she's our Group Strategy Corporate Ventures and Investor Relations Director. And she's also on our Group Executive Committee. So that uh, uh, along with Antonio, uh, William uh, and the rest of the Exec Committee. So um, unlike our ShareSock event last year, we're unfortunately not able to be with you in person uh, and have a discussion over lunch this time. But we are delighted to have the opportunity to present to you in this virtual format and hope that you will find our session interesting and useful. Carla will first provide you with a strategic update on the business. And I will then run through our recent financial performance in Q3. After that, we will open up for Q&A and Carla and I will be very happy to take any questions you might have. I believe you should be able to submit questions through the Q&A box on your Zoom screen. Before we start, I'd like to show you a short video. This year has clearly been an eventful and challenging one, and we'd like to take a moment to share with you what the group has been doing in response to the pandemic. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you very much indeed. I, I, hope, I hope you enjoyed that video and it provided you with a good insight of how Lloyd's as a bank has played a critical part in helping Britain recover through the recent pandemic. It was clearly an internal video, but I hopefully provided some insight to, to yourselves. Now let me hand you over to Carla to give you an update on our strategy. Carla joined the group in October 2015 and was instrumental in leading our current 2018 to 2020 group strategic review. Carla, over to you. Thank you, Douglas, and welcome everyone. Good morning to everyone, and thank you for joining our webinar today. A little different to what we had this time last year, but hopefully uh, one that we can have a good conversation and, and you get a good overview of our strategic progress to date and, and also on the recent developments. Let me start, though, with a little bit of an introduction to Lloyds Banking Group. Um, so we're the UK largest financial services provider. Many of you know that. We've got 26 million customers across our key businesses. That's retail, commercial banking and insurance. We have the largest branch network and digital bank in the UK, and we're present in every community. And this has been enormously supportive of our purpose, which has been very clear and at the heart of what we do, which is helping Britain prosper. Our strategy is a distinctive one. We're focused on a multi-brand, a multi-channel customer proposition, and we've got market-leading efficiency, where we pride ourselves with rigorous execution and a management discipline, which hopefully has resulted, and you have seen that throughout the year, in a prudent and low-risk approach to both capital allocation and investment in order to sustain our competitive advantages. And I think this year has really been a year where that's come through. Next slide, please. So what you can see here is that we've got strong market shares across all products. We are the number one play in mortgages with about a fifth of the market. We're also the number one play in credit cards with 24% share. And we've got a very big market share also on personal current accounts with 22% market share. and have grown our market share from 13 to 19% in the last decade. We have got strong market shares, but we still have also have room for growth. And those are our targeted key segments. In wealth, for example, we've got a mere 2% market share, which is significantly below our average market share of 18%. In addition, we're also the only bank in the UK with a full-scale insurance business through Scottish Widows. And this unique bank assurance model positions us well to take advantage of the structural demographic changes, as well as market share growth opportunities in insurance and wealth. You've heard from us in the past, we're investing in services such as financial planning and retirement, 
protection and home insurance in order to in order to build the resilience of other income line which uh, will also help improve our income diversification and that is very much at the heart of how we're thinking of our future investment we're now number one player in home insurance in the uk and that has been one of the successes of our investment you've also probably heard about our schroders personal wealth joint venture that became operational last year and is doing very well we have a very ambitious plan and a, a aim to become a top three UK financial planning business in this space by 2023. And this strategic partnership combines our significant client base with our scale, our multi-channel distribution, the digital capabilities that Schroder's investment and wealth management also bring alongside their expertise. So really the vision is a combined vision to become the primary partner for all of our customer financial needs across banking, insurance and wealth. And we think we're unique in being able to say that in the UK. And so that is really what we're striving for in terms of our strategic targets going forward. Next slide, please. So really what we've done is we've continued to build um, on uh, an inclusive and a more sustainable future. We've adapted a proactive response to the, to the pandemic and we're working closely and have been working closely with the government, our regulators and other stakeholders to support customers and businesses up and down the country as we help Britain recover, which is at the heart of the group's purpose. You saw that in, the, in a few of those snippets in the film, but let me just also highlight that we're particularly focused on mental health and well-being. We committed another year of 25 and a half million to our in independent charitable foundations, and we've made that commitment also for 2021, and that will enable them to continue their vital work without having to be distracted about that funding. We've been deeply moved by recent events around the world, and they've also highlighted the vital importance of diversity and how much we still have to do. We announced earlier in the year a race action plan, which will drive cultural change across the organization, while also ensuring diversity of recruitment and progression. And we've actually quantified our target to increase black representation in senior roles, in addition to our existing diversity targets where we were also market leading in terms of targeting that. It's clearly the right thing to do for our colleagues and for the benefit of the group. But I'd also like to highlight that it was also important and it was recognized by Moody's, one of our rating agencies, and they recognized that race action plan as a credit positive. So we feel that really diversity and uh, our uh, plans here are super important for our strategy. Finally, on sustainability, we've announced an ambitious goal to reduce carbon emissions. We finance by over 50% by 2030. At the same time, we've already met our internal carbon reduction target for 2030, so that was ahead of time. So we're working on developing more ambitious and new targets in that space. We've launched five new, just as an example, we've launched five new green customer propositions. We've committed to invest another two billion in BlackRock's climate transition fund. These actions and many more, which are happening right now, are the right things to do to support diversity and sustainability and will directly aid the recovery of the UK economy from which we all benefit. And it is fully aligned with the group's long-term strategic objectives, the position of the franchise and the interest of our shareholders. Next slide, please. As you can see, the pandemic has created challenges for all our stakeholders, and we played a cru crucial role to, in that recovery. We remained focused on working with all the stakeholders to support customers and colleagues, help Britain recover and rebuild trust, including the challenge of responding to personal and business customers in financial stress. We've just recently received our employee survey and our latest annual employee survey showed an improvement in all key metrics despite this challenging year with the highest ever engagement score of 81%. This is a significant improvement in what has been a really tough year and colleagues have been saying, and I'll just highlight a few of the areas, that our environment is caring, it's supportive and that colleague feedback was strongly positive in terms of our COVID response and how we were there for all of our different stakeholders. Next. So let us have a little bit of a, a sort of a view in terms of uh, where we've got to and, uh, and our strategic path uh, and evolution. So what this slide shows is the illustration since 2011 where we've um, evolved our targets. The first phase uh, in terms of the strategic plan, the so-called GSR1, they reshaped, it reshaped our portfolio. It simplified the group, it strengthened the balance sheet that badly needed it, and it increased investment in the core business. A second phase, GSR2, basically built on that uh, strength and it focused on delivering growth 
becoming a simpler and a more efficient company and creating the best experience for our customers. As we approach the end of this last phase, and each one of these is a three year strategy plan, what we've seen is, uh, uh, is the, what we've really been focusing is on trying to transform the group and transform the group for success in a digital world, which is really the main strategic aim of the last three years, whilst at the heart of our core purpose continue to help Britain prosper. And it is important to highlight the progress we've made in terms of digital. When it comes to digital this year, for instance, we've seen shifts and accelerated shifts in customer behavior because of COVID that we think are likely to endure. Digital adoption by customers, even though it was already quite high, has accelerated and businesses have become more digital and cashless. I will talk more about this in digital in, in, a, in a little while. Obviously this year, the macro outlook has deteriorated given the pandemic. And although government actions have delayed some economic impacts, the outlook remains challenging. Despite the headwinds this year, overall, we have delivered significant progress under GSR3. And for example, in terms of that digital transformation I've just mentioned of our cost base, we've diversified our income and we've launched, like I've already mentioned, the Schroeder's Personal Wealth Joint Venture, as well as upskilling our colleagues, all of these which were our targeted areas of investment. Our strategy is underpinned by increasing levels of strategic investment, which is really only possible because we have a business model that allows for us to be able to generate that organically. The investment drives improvements in customer experience, which we continue to see with peak um, and uh, record highs of customer NPS, and it delivers further productivity enhancements, which ultimately creates greater investment capacity and underpins strong and sustainable returns. We call this the virtuous cycle, we hope, and that is a key competitive advantage of our business model. Next. Uh, our long-term investment in digital transformation positions us well to continue to serve our customers. We were the first bank to recognize the power of digital. We created a standalone division across the whole bank in 2013, and we had actually that reporting directly into the chief executive. Our recognized digital leadership position is creating new opportunities. We're the largest bank in the UK. We have 17.1 million digital active users. 12.1 million of those use our mobile, and this is up 1.4 in the first nine months of 2020, an amazing growth during this period. We're also very pleased with the continued customer growth and a clear strategic advantage versus other insurance and wealth providers. Customers tend to log into our app 25 times a month. That is a 3.1 billion, staggering billion log on so far this year. And every time we have that, we have an opportunity to liaise and to hear back from our customers. It has enabled us to serve them more, uh, more of their needs digitally through a challenging period. And we've seen an increase in products originated digitally by 18% so far. And I've also mentioned, it's not at the expense of quality. Our digital net promoter score, which is really important because it's the direct feedback we get from our customers is up 8% over the same period. We have this feature called the unique single customer view capability, which where we're trying to get to is where the group, where you as a customer to the group can leverage all of our retail banking relationships, but also have ability to see that in terms of what the insurance and your pensions, et cetera, to have that functionality. Again, this is a clear distinctive advantage of the group versus other banks. And those customers that we have on the single customer view, view their products alongside the bank every month. And so that is also seen an increase in the quarter and they're coming through the mobile app. We will continue to maintain and will maintain our relentless focus on supporting customers and the UK economy whilst we invest for the future. And that we think is our heart of our competitive advantage. Next. The crisis has highlighted some of these new emerging trends we've talked about. It also has highlighted and has accelerated our response. And I think the group is mindful and we spend a lot of time between board, executive committee and leadership team to definitely discuss and to uh, think of the longer term impacts of the crisis and how we respond to them. We're seeing the emergence of new trends, the acceleration of others, as you can tell on the slide. Some of these are likely to prove more challenging for the industry. Others present great opportunities for a business that is engaged and as customer focused as ours. As a result of our long term, long run transformation, which we had started years ago, the group is built upon strong foundations supporting our response. They include a strong financial position, our unique business model, and the strengths of the multi channel and multi brand, which we are very clear are here to stay. A willingness to adopt new ways of working through the use of technology and greater collaboration with external technology partners. And this, we think, is really what differentiates our franchise. 
These foundations leave the group well equipped, we think, to provide a compelling offering for our customers and colleagues in the future, and also enabling long-term superior and sustainable returns. And with that, I will hand over to Douglas, who will tell us about our recent financial performance. Okay, uh, so good. Uh, thank you, Carla. Um, there's been some problems. My computer has crashed, so I am now doing it by phone. Um, <laughs> so, so let's just continue from there. Um, if we could move on the slides as we progress. So, so thank you, Carla. So, so first of all, before I actually focus on recent results, I wanted to say a few words about um, leadership succession um, at Lloyd's. Um, you'll probably have seen the headlines on this in the press recently, given our announcements last week. Um, in July this year, we announced that Robin Budenberg would take over from our current chairman, Lord Blackwell, who is standing down after a nine-year tenure at Lloyd's. Robin joined the board on the 1st of October and is currently in a period of handover before formally taking over as chair on January the 1st. Also in July, our CEO, Antonio Horta-Rosario, announced his intention to retire from Lloyd's in the first half of 2021. <clears throat> and subsequently has um, announced, uh, via an announcement last week, we announced that he'll be leaving at the end of April uh, next year. Since Robin joined the board, he has conducted a search for Antonio's successor, and last week the group announced that Charlie Nunn will be taking over as CEO of Lloyd's Banking Group next year. Charlie was most recently Global Head of Wealth and Personal Banking at HSBC, and he'll bring world-class <clears throat> operational technology and strategic expertise to Lloyd's to build on our existing strengths and continue to develop our strategy. It was also announced last week that Antonio will leave Lloyd's at the end of April, as I've just mentioned, to take up his new position as chairman of Credit Suisse. Mean meanwhile, though, he is completely focused, along with the executive team, on delivering the current plan and working through the next stage of the strategy in terms of plans and priorities for next year. The board is determined to make sure this carries forward without any loss of momentum. <clears throat> the exact timing of Charlie's arrival is still uncertain and will depend on negotiations with HSBC. But in the meantime, we have confirmed that our CFO, William Chalmers, will take on the role of acting group CEO during any interim period, if there is one. So now turning to the next slide and looking at recent financial performance. We saw an encouraging business recovery in the third quarter, driven by the group's resilient business model and the reduced impairment charge in the quarter. Despite a challenging operating environment, we have seen the open mortgage book grow by three and a half billion in the quarter. And with a 22% share of approvals, this represents the highest volume of organic growth in approvals in a quarter since 2008. We have also continued to see retail current accounts growing ahead of the market through the third quarter and group deposits are now 35 billion higher than at the end of the last year. We have seen a step change in financial performance in Q3 with a return to profitability. This is largely due to lower impairments given the absence of IFRS 9 driven impairments, which I'll explain more fully later, but also to an increase in business volumes and has enabled the group to deliver a return on tangible equity of 7.4% in the third quarter. Costs remain an area of intense focus for the group. The 4% reduction in year-to-date total costs versus the same period last year is driven mainly by 5% lower business-as-usual costs. The group's cost-income ratio performance, meanwhile, has clearly been impacted by the challenging revenue environment. Pre-provision operating profit of $5 billion year-to-date includes one and a half billion in the quarter. And while this is down 6% on, on Q2, it still gives very significant loss absorbing capacity. Impairment in the third quarter was benign relative to expectations, and we are not seeing any notable deterioration in our portfolios at present. Importantly, the strength of the balance sheet was further increased. We increased our CT1 capital ratio to 15.2% well above our capital requirements and target, and our loan to deposit ratio is now 98%.
turning on to the next slide and to look at how the group's customer franchise performed in Q3. As I mentioned, we've seen strong growth in the mortgage book in the quarter, and this builds a strong pipeline looking into Q4. Based on that, we expect the open book performance in Q4 to be stronger than in the third quarter. As can be seen on the chart, consumer finance, notably credit cards and motor finance, continues to be impacted by the pandemic, but has performed at the better end of expectations. At the half year, we had expected balances to be down around 5 to 10% in the second half. Given the performance in Q3, we now expect balances to be closer to 5% down in H2. In commercial, <clears throat> we continue to see SME lending driven by the government support schemes. We have now delivered over 11 billion of government guaranteed lending with a market share of 18%. Going the other way, corporate and institutional balances are down 4.8 billion in the quarter, as we have continued to see clients pay down their revolving credit facilities, whilst we have also continued our work on reducing low returning relationships. Average interest earning assets are up 1 billion on Q2, and for the fourth quarter, we would expect continued support for AIEAs from the strong growth in the open mortgage book, as mentioned. On the other side of the balance sheet, our retail current account growth is ahead of the market, and meanwhile, commercial is benefiting from around 50% of support scheme lending remaining on deposit. Net interest, that go turning on to the next slide, net interest income, that is largely the interest earned on our lending book, is 8.1 billion year to date, or 2.6 billion in the quarter. The 13% decline year on year is due to a reduction in the group's net interest margin with stable AIEAs. However, there was an encouraging sequential improvement versus Q2, driven by strong mortgage performance, as I already mentioned. This attractive asset growth will continue to support AIEAs in the fourth quarter and is therefore supportive of group interest income. The net interest margin is the interest rate that the group earns on lending, less what we pay to depositors and our funding costs. The decline in net interest margin versus last year reflects lower rates. The base rate fell from 0.75% to 0.1% in the period. Changes in asset mix, as well as actions taken to support customers, such as with interest-free overdrafts, as you can see on the chart. However, it is worth noting that the margins increased slightly in the third quarter as we saw better consumer finance balances versus expectations. A full quarter's benefit of deposit repricing and the benefit of significant low-cost deposit growth, as well as overdraft charging starting to come back into the margin. It is worth noting that new business mortgage margins are attractive and higher than the business that is rolling off the book. Taken together, the better-than-expected real economy lending is currently offsetting the challenging interest rate environment and is supportive of interest income. Other income of $3.4 billion for the nine months includes approximately $1 billion in Q3, as you can see on the chart. This is clearly below our aspirations and is due to the continued relatively low levels of activity across our key markets, as well as a one-off regulatory charge. Overall, we expect other income to remain subject to similar pressures in the fourth quarter. However, we are now around the base level from which we would expect activity to start to recover in 2021. As Carla mentioned earlier, we are investing in both resilience and in diversification, including, for example, in our markets platforms and payments propositions in commercial, as well as our products, platforms, and the Schroeder's personal wealth joint venture with insurance and wealth. <clears throat> Turning to the next slide. Our well-known intense focus on costs remains as important as ever. As you can see in this slide, we have sustainably reduced costs by a total of 25% since 2011. We continue to strengthen our cost leadership as reflected by our cost income ratio remaining the lowest amongst our peers in the sector. Total costs have come down by 4% year on year, including a 5% reduction in BAU costs. This has been achieved despite deferring all role-based restructuring activity for a number of months this year, resulting in a higher than expected average headcount, albeit with lower bonus accruals. Our track record of ongoing sustainable cost savings 
has enabled continued investment in the business. We've invested a total of 1.6 billion so far in 2020 and made strategic investments of 2.6 billion since 2018. Investment spend has been adapted to the pandemic situation, but we remain absolutely committed to investing in the long-term success of the group, especially in our digital capabilities. The benefit of this investment has been particularly evident during the pandemic, as you heard earlier. Turning to the next slide, as I mentioned earlier, the impairment experience in Q3 has been benign due to the better than expected macroeconomic environment and the continued presence of government and bank customer support schemes. The total impairment charge of 301 million for the third quarter or Q3 recognizes this benign picture. Excluding the impact of the revised economic scenarios and the coronavirus impact of restructuring cases on commercial, our impairment charge for the nine months was pretty similar to pre-crisis levels a year ago at around 990 million. However, as you can see, our total impairment charge for this year is considerably higher at 4.1 billion. This is largely due to the IFRS 9 accounting approach, which requires us to reflect expected future credit losses based on our economic expectations. Given a significant deterioration in economic expectations earlier this year, we had to take a large provision, and most of this additional provision was taken in the second quarter of this year. Importantly, these losses are a modelled view of future losses, not actual losses. This means that we have not seen a significant increase in credit losses, but have built large provisions which provide additional balance sheet resilience ahead of potential losses to come. The main drivers of impairment charges for us are GDP, unemployment and house prices. As you can see, our provision actually reflects a range of economic scenarios, including our severe downside, weighted at 10%, which assumes GDP down 9.4%, and HPI down 24% over three years. Our base case, which is weighted at 30%, assumes GDP down by 1% over three years, with unemployment at around 8% in 2021. The overall impact of our multiple economic scenarios is currently provided expected credit loss of 7.1 billion. This provides significant balance sheet resilience and protection against future credit impairments. Turning to slide five, I thought it'd be helpful to give you an overview of our overall portfolio. The group has a very robust balance sheet, which benefits from a prudent approach to lending, and around 85% of our lending is secured. Meanwhile, we have more than 75% of group lending within our prime retail portfolio. Two thirds of the group lending is in high quality UK mortgages, with an average LTV of 44%, and more than 99% of the book having an LTV below 90%. The remaining 25% of the loan book is within commercial banking, of which 40% is to SMEs and mid market corporates, which in turn is 80% secured. This gives us a high level of confidence that our balance sheet is robust and our customer mix is appropriate during this period of uncertainty. Although the size of the balance sheet has remained pretty stable over the last 10 years, we have actually halved risk-weighted assets, or RWAs, over the last decade, reflecting a significant de-risking of the portfolio and meaning that we can be a more capital efficient organization. <clears throat> a quick note on payment holidays. As you know, we have offered unwavering support to our customers through this pandemic and have been quick to respond to their evolving needs. This includes granting payment holidays on more than 60, 69 billion of retail lending in order to help our customers manage temporary financial pressures. The vast majority of those have now matured with around 80, 87% of customers repaying and early arrears are low at just under 4% of matured payment holidays. I'm now going to look briefly at the group's exposure to certain commercial sectors that have clearly been impacted by the crisis. The commercial portfolio has been subject to careful risk management in recent years. Around 70% of total medium and large corporate exposure is to investment grade clients, while around 80% of SME and mid corporate lending is secured. Within this, our exposure to the sectors most impacted by coronavirus, such as hospitality and non-food retail, is modest in the context of the group. It is only around 2% of group lending or around 12% of commercial lending. There was a small reduction in the exposure to these impacted sectors during the quarter. Drawn commercial facilities have fallen by around 2 billion in the quarter. This means that the full 8 billion which was drawn down at the beginning of the crisis has now been repaid 
and these clients' drawings are back to pre-crisis levels, further reducing our risk. Finally, on commercial, our, our CRE portfolio or commercial real estate portfolio has reduced by 0.4 billion since the half year to circa 14 billion, whilst we have maintained average LTV, or that's loan to value, at 49%, with over two thirds below 60% loan to value. <clears throat> so in summary, there is still significant uncertainty and our performance is inextricably linked to the performance of the UK economy. But we believe we are well placed to deliver for customers and shareholders. Strong growth in both deposits and lending has enabled us to offset the impacts of the challenging rate environment. Together with a stable economic environment, this has contributed to a return to profitability in Q3. We see the strong pickup in mortgage activity being sustained into 2021, driving growth in our net interest income. The group's solid pre-provision profitability, prudent reserving and enhanced capital strength give significant loss absorbing capacity. They also mean that we are in a strong position to support our customers despite the ongoing uncertainty. We have a strong capital position. Our CT1 ratio stood at 15.2% at Q3, comfortably above our regulatory requirement of around 11% and our internal target of circa 12.5% plus a management buffer of around 1%. I'm sure that you are all keen to know what this means for dividends and when they might resume. We are very aware of the importance of dividends for our shareholders. We have a strong capital position and a track record of generating capital. But as usual, the board will consider any capital return at year end when they will look at all available information, including, and in particular, the economic outlook, as well as capital levels and regulatory requirements. This will, of course, also be dependent on the regulator allowing banks to pay dividends again. And clearly, we would hope for news on that in the next few weeks. Our guidance for 2020 reflects our proactive response to the challenging economic environment, with net interest margin expected to remain broadly stable in the fourth quarter, resulting in a full year margin of around 250 basis points. Operating costs are expected to be below 7.6 billion. Impairment is now expected to be at the lower end of the 4.5 to 5.5 billion range. And RWAs are now expected to be broadly stable at the Q3 level. In conclusion, Uncertainties remain, but we have great confidence in the future of the group. We will emerge from this crisis having learned a great deal about our customers and new ways of working. There is clearly still uncertainty, but whatever the future brings, we will maintain our focus on supporting our customers and the UK economy. This is the right thing to do and is in the best interests of the group and our shareholders. That concludes our presentation for this morning. Thank you for listening, and we are happy to take your questions. As a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A box on your screen, and we'll address them one by one. Thank you very okay, much, Douglas. Can I just um, ask you, can you see the questions as though you've now phoned in, or would you like me to read the questions out now? That's OK. I can actually see, that, see them on my screen. I've managed to reboot whilst I've been talking. So... Um, Essentially, I can see the questions and I'll go through and we will work from there. Um, and the only difference is this, is that you just won't see, see me over video responding. <laughs> OK, well, I'll, I'll so, leave it to you and uh, Carla then to uh, take uh, those questions. But thank you very much excellent. both of you for a clear presentation. Excellent. Great. OK, so a couple of questions came in before the actual start of the presentation. And the first one was, um, can you confirm the dividend policy? And have you ever considered moving to quarterly dividends? Um, so I, I touched upon this in my in my um, in 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 the words that I spoke about a couple of minutes ago. Um, historically, you know, clearly we had a progressive, sustainable, um, ordinary dividend policy, and we would look towards um, supplementing that um, and um, looking to repatriate any excess capital that we had. Clearly, at this moment in time, we are prevented from paying dividends. Um, given the, um, the, the the regulatory requirements, and, and that's something that is in force for for all banks, uh, not just from a UK perspective, but also from a, a European perspective. Um, clearly, 
the, the board makes a decision on dividends at the end of the year. Um, that's very much consistent policy, um, and they will continue to do that this year. So the board will consider dividends in the light of any regulatory announcement that is made um, in advance of the full year results that are at the end of February. And that will take into consideration the capital position of the group, the, the regulatory environment, um, and indeed um, future expectations for for the business uh, and the capital position. As I've already said, you know, the group has um, a very strong capital position as it stands at the moment, which is significantly um, in excess of both the regulatory requirement and indeed our, our regulatory requirement, which is more like about 11%, uh, and indeed our, our target, which is the around 12 and a half plus around one. So um, we'll be able to confirm details, um, you know, you know with the full year results. Um, the, the link question to that was, have you ever considered moving to quarterly dividends? Well, of course, the interesting element to that is actually back in 2000 and back in May last year, so May 2019, we actually announced our intention to pay quarterly dividends. Um, and, and actually, the first quarterly dividend would have been payable in June 2020. Um, but we were unable to pay those dividends because of the dividend ban um, that was in force. So at this moment in time, we still have a, um, a, a quarterly payment schedule, um, but clearly we will have to just um, look to see um, how that progresses you know, with, with the full year and, and how it pans out with um, regulatory announcements and, and the capital position. Um, so I think that addresses the, the dividend point. Is there anything that you would want to add, Carla? No, only only what you reinforced, which is the board will have to review this, uh, and that is assuming that we get the green light from the regulator, which is obviously the first thing that needs to happen for this discussion to even be on the table. Indeed. Okay, so um, another question I we received in advance was, um, how do the directors now feel about the failure of the then directors to withhold material facts in the takeover of HBOS in 2008? in liaison with the government of Gordon Brown, the Bank of England and other statutory bodies in clear contravention of the city code. Now, clearly, I would dis disagree with that question. I've read out the question exactly as it stands. Um, you know, our view is very much is that we didn't withhold any material facts um, when the, uh, the acquisition of HBOS was initially announced um, back in 2008. And I say, don't believe that there was any other um, you know, uh, below the lines coercion um, taking place. So from our perspective, there was no, there were no material facts that were withheld at that time. Clearly, that is a, a long time ago now. Um, you know, we've had the man management, new management team in place. Antonio Horta Rosario as the CEO has very much been looking to progress, both initially with the integration of both um, uh, Halifax um, and Lloyd's, and then transforming the business and has been successful in the last few years. Clearly, there have been significant issues, both from a market perspective, with when you look at the, you know, the COVID crisis in recent years, and also, which I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, the challenges of a PPI, which have significantly impacted returns over that period. Um, but um, clearly, from, from, from our perspective, we're very much focused on um, ensuring that the business delivers to the best of its capability and delivering, um, you know, uh, uh, strong and sustainable returns. Okay, looking to um, the um, specific questions that have come on during our presentation itself. The first one, um, is Lloyd's a commercial enterprise or a not-for-profit organisation? At times it feel like, feels like it operates in an environment which severely limits its commercial freedom. The restriction on paying dividends this year springs to mind. Public opinion also expects it to operate branches in numerous locations where the majority of the very same public has demonstrated that it doesn't use, need a branch, but really just wants an ATM. What is the point of spending millions on capital adequacy stress tests if the results of those stress tests are ignored at the first sign of an economic downturn? Our, um, and linked to that, it then talks about are private investors ever going to see a return on the investment and linked to dividends. Um, so let's there are various questions in there, uh, which could take me a while to respond to. Um, but let's, um, let's just look at the, the first question, first of all. And Carla, I'm sure that you'll have input to, to some of these responses as well. Um, 
The first one, you know, is Lloyd's a commercial enterprise or a not-for-profit organization? Absolutely, Lloyd's is a commercial enterprise. Um, you know, it is when you look at um, how the business is created, we understand, as do our other, other stakeholders, that um, shareholders are the, the almost the most important stakeholder and we need to deliver returns where it is possible to do so. However, in the current environment, it is absolutely clear that in order to deliver sustainable returns, we need to meet the requirements of different stakeholders, in particular customers, but also regulators and indeed other stakeholders that exist. In exactly the same way, when you look at the COVID crisis um, uh, and the, the significant amount of support that we have provided to, to customers, both on the commercial side and on the retail side, when you look at mortgage payment holidays, we very much believe that that is in the best interest of customers and the group as a whole. We are fundamentally linked to the UK economy. The stronger the UK economy performs, the stronger that we will perform as an organization. Tyler, do you want to add a few words to that? Yes, absolutely. Um, first of all, I don't think these aspects are mutually exclusive. You don't have to decide to be one or the other. I think you can actually be a commercial enterprise, which needs to, which if you think about it, the basic principles are you can uh, generate organically driven capital. You are able to uh, afford your investment needs. You're able to afford and, and to continue to improve on the efficiency. But at the same time, we operate in a society and those society demands need to be reflected because that's also what gives us the business model that is sustainable in the future. We've spent a huge amount of time over the last year or more um, discussing the societal aspects, um, but also discussing what areas we can lead and where we can as a bank and as a financial group that has retail, commercial and an insurance business in the UK be at the forefront of providing financial solutions to our customers, which ultimately is what we're here to do. Um, but I do think that the uh, broader stakeholder map needs to be thought of if we're going to have a long term sustainable business model. And that includes having returns that are sustainable as well. Absolutely. And that's, that's exactly why you know, in recent times what you've heard is um, you know, a priority from our, our, our CFO is to actually ensure that return on equity exceeds cost of equity in the medium term. And that remains very much a priority for the group as a whole. As Carla's already outlined, um, you know, we, we feel that there is you know, significant opportunity in the franchise as it stands at the moment. And we're very much looking to to grow in certain elements of the business. Um, and um, we have a new strategy that will um, be presented um, next year. And that will very much look towards extending on, as Carla's already articulated in her presentation, extending on the, the success of what we call our GSR 1, so the Group Strategic Review 1, 2 and 3 over the last 10 years. And very much we, we feel that there is significant opportunity still within the group for full growth and delivery of returns. Okay, um, so uh, the next question that came in was, um, are there any plans for international expansion given that your market share in the UK is already very high? Well, I think, um, I mean, Carla's already articulated there that you know, we have significant opportunities in a number of product areas. But do you want to provide any further detail, Carla? Yeah, no, I mean, fundamentally, we're a UK based and UK focused um, institution, and that will remain. I think we are definitely um, still see areas of potential growth, and it's those that we're fundamentally targeting. I also think we want to make sure we diversify our income stream. As you know, we've had a um, majority of our income and revenues comes from net interest income. So we want to make sure, especially in a low rate environment, that we're able to go uh, into areas which provide other operating income, which make our PL more resilient and make it more sustainable as well, even if the rate environment is to remain as low as it is today. So I think we feel there's much more to be explored. There's also different business models that are emerging, which we're also trying to understand whether they are um, 
applicable to us. But if you think of the biggest area of opportunity is probably to be the single provider for financial needs for our personal customers. And that's really a unique feature of the fact that we have an insurance company and we'll have, we have the wealth offering as well. And so it's that area that I think we have huge amount of growth opportunities and still pockets. And whilst that's not done, I think um, you will see us very much continue to focus as we have on the UK. Thank you, Carla. I'm, 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 the, the next question is going to come to you as well, actually, because um, clearly in, in, in the areas that you run, obviously you look after investor relations, you look after um, group strategy, and you also look after group corporate development. And obviously from a group corporate development perspective well, and the strategic ventures, it's very much about um, M&A. And the question that we've that has come in is, you know, there are, there are press re reports about Lloyd's interest in buying Starlink. Uh, is there anything that you can tell us about that? No, I mean, the, the thing I can tell you is that um, as a group, and there's a group that generates capital, we will, as a matter of fact, look at inorganic opportunities as much as we look at organic investment. And so um, we just think that that's just the right way to do it. We need to compare and contrast. And when it comes down to investment, we need to know what is out there. But there is no comments other than uh, saying that that is what we do. And that's what um, normally institutions do, and especially in the corporate development uh, function. We look at a lot of things. We say no to most of them. Yeah, and, and yeah, exactly. Yeah, with that, there, there are certainly... Um, Plenty of organic opportunities available to the group when we when we look at it, and as you say, Carla, you know, selective inorganic opportunities will be will be looked at, but only if they're in the best interest of shareholders and the future. Okay, um, so um, and a couple of other questions that have that have come in. Um, let's look at that. This. Um, so the next question actually relates to branch closures. Um, and a topic that looks like a difficult tightrope walk. What is Lloyd's approach to this? Um, well, let, let me let me kick off um, on on that perspective. I mean, Lloyd's has been very clear, and I say Carla mentioned it. I think this was almost on her first slide that that we have a uh, a, a multi-channel, multi-brand approach when it comes to um, UK banking and and supporting our customers. And we very much believe that. That branches are a key part of the proposition um, for our customer base. Now, the role of the role of those branches is changing. It's quite clear that the football, the footfall, and the amount of um, the amount that branches is used um, is changing. Um, certainly, the the use of branches and from a customer perspective, from a transaction perspective, is is reducing. So, the role of branches will need to change. Uh, the role of the branches is going to be very much more used for, um, you'd say, advisory services, whether that be first-time buyers and mortgages, whether that be small businesses. Um, now, clearly, in the current environment, the whole role of branches and um, the, the, uh, the optimum size of the network will be reviewed. It's, it's only natural, but it's reviewed on the basis of um, customer usage um, from that perspective. We've very much made a commitment um, to have almost like the largest um, branch network in the UK. So we currently have a market share of branches of about about 21%. Now, clearly, if the, uh, the overall number of uh, branches and the customer demand does fall, then clearly the number of branches will fall. And um, like many of our peers, we have announced branch closures, um, and that could well continue. Um, but for us, it's very much about having a, a, a multi-channel strategy that meets the needs of our customers. Douglas, Is there anything, Carl, you'd want to add to that? Good. So, so what we've done, and we've we've explained this in the past, is we don't see branches as a cost lever. So, <clears> for <throat> us, in terms of branch closures, it's really what Douglas was saying. It's really about customer usage and 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 uh, and customer trends. There is no denying that COVID crisis has accelerated. Um, the, the lower use of, uh, of branches. Uh, on the flip side, it increased uh, the use and, and the number of digital customers. And frankly, our, it, it's been pretty extraordinary how during this crisis, um, there's been not only the increase that you saw in deposits and loans, but also just 
market share and market attention and customer share of wallet, which is great. And we feel really, really privileged and proud of that. But um, but back to branches, I think that the, the biggest commitment we have is we will maintain the largest branch market share. Our peers have been closing branches faster than we have. So that 21% that uh, Douglas has just mentioned has probably gone up a tiny bit because they've been closing branches faster than we have. Um, and I think more importantly, certainly as we look to what branches can be in the future, we're trying to think of what other uh, areas we can use them. So whether it's for our business banking customers, whether it's for also staff, as, as we think of the new uh, ways of working. Um, but, but, you know, fundamentally at the heart of who we are is a multi-channel. Um, and I think what we will probably be doing is using more of the technology that we are all on today, which is video conferencing um, and, and telephony in a way that probably before COVID, we didn't even realize could be possible. So that's the evolution of our multi-channel distribution strategy, which will continue to evolve. Um, but the commitment is we will maintain the largest market share uh, in terms of branches in the UK. Excellent. Okay, another question that uh, has come in um, actually says, um, will Lloyd's guarantee that they will not take action to redeem the existing cumulative irredeemable preference shares following the disastrous attempt by Aviva to redeem at par and the recent FCA pronouncement on the subject? Well, what I, what I, how I would respond to that is I would say that any company that decides to take action against those uh, existing um, cumulative irredeemable preference shares, whether it be ourselves, whether it be anyone else, I think would be seen to be very racy and taking a significant risk. I think um, I think in the current environment, you saw the um, the response to the Aviva announcement. You saw the um, the uh, ultimately the approach that they took. I think it's quite clear that other market participants will have seen and heard and taken account of everything that was um, uh, as a result of that, you could almost say debacle. Um, and I would say that, uh, you know, we very much, we very much noted the response. And I think any company that took that approach would be taking a significant risk. Okay, moving on to the next question. Um, and this is an interesting one, Carla, because this actually refers to actually helping Britain, helping Britain prosper, and actually, uh, you know, as we're evolving it into helping Britain recover. Um, it says, you know, this is not a question about hard facts and figures, but it is interesting to note that the purpose of the group is helping Britain prosper. Is this a new purpose made with the shift of society to, to more humanitarian aims, such as ESG, et cetera? Um, I, I mean, very much I'll cover, look, for us, Lloyd's as an organization, you know, helping Britain prosper, is not new. I um, mean, let's be clear. And actually, when you look at the elements that are among it, so the E, S, and G, so that's the environment, the social, and the governance aspects, again, they're not new to us because actually it's been an integral part of the way that we look at the business over the, over the well, it has been over the last probably eight, 10 years. Um, what I would say is that the way it's integrated um, within the organization and the focus of the market has, has moved significantly. Um, and, and we very much believe that actually helping Britain prosper or helping Britain recover is fundamental to the way that we operate and actually operating a sustainable, responsible business is fundamental to operating a, a long-term successful business. Carla, do you want to actually add any extra elements? Because clearly this is something that's discussed a lot at GEC yeah. uh, and indeed board. It is, and it is at the heart of who we are. Um, I would recommend if you, uh, if any of you who are on the call have the time to go on our, our website if, if you haven't had the chance yet. And we have a dedicated uh, ESG presentation, which um, we're proud to say is market leading, but really does pull a lot of this together. Um, so helping Britain prosper, uh, to Douglas's point, has been around, and I believe it was around um, in 2013, 2014 with its origins. Um, and, and very much the way that the plans have been built around that were 
uh, around the topics of ESG. It, we just didn't have that nomenclature and we didn't call it that. Um, the truth is we've made huge steps and we've made huge progress on many areas. But as with everything, all of this, we, you know, there's more to be done. And so we're very proud of, especially around uh, inclusion and diversity, some of the progress that we've done around sustainability, the support that we've had, but it's in constant evolution. And so the question that I think was there was something in there as well is I think the helping Britain recover is the natural evolution of helping Britain prosper. And it is adequate for where we are and especially adequate for where we are in a sort of as we come out of the COVID crisis. Um, you'll also potentially have seen um, there is. Uh, uh, the press has been uh, reporting on the big conversation. So this is a conversation that we've been having with many stakeholders around the communities and around the local um, uh, communities that we are in it, getting their feedback essentially on the major stakeholders in terms of the areas of societal um, concerns where we think as Lloyds Banking Group, we have the most impact and, and the likelihood of having the most impact to actually change and improve people's lives and our customers. And with that comes this sort of evolution. Um, we will be presenting more on this with our full year results, so I don't want to disclose much more. But for those who are sort of whose curiosity, hopefully I've sparked, please do check on our investor relations website um, that ESG presentation I've just mentioned. That's probably a very good point to um, let us wrap up, unless there's any particular Actually, Cliff, questions Cliff, you Cliff, wish just to before you do, There is just one uh, question that did come up. Please, this is going to be a very do. short question, question to respond to, So, I, and I think it's worth being out there. There was a question that came up from one gentleman that said, what percentage of equity capital is held by the UK government? By what date is it planned that holding will reduce to zero? I just wanted to confirm to everyone out there that the UK government is no longer a shareholder in, uh, in Lloyd's Banking Group. Um, we, we managed, they, they managed to sell their stake a number of years ago. So I just wanted to make that, clarify that particular thank point. Thank you very we... much. Yeah. And well done for do, doing that. Um, and thank you very much, uh, Carla and Douglas, for engaging with individual shareholders in this way. Um, it's really terrific. I've noticed that since you announced this seminar, the share price of Lloyd's Bank has increased by 50%. Uh, I put it down entirely to share soccer and, and Alex uh, organising this event. No, no, seriously, there's co correlation and causation. Um, but hopefully you'll have more of these events in the future. Thank you. Um, a little reminders, um, please provide feedback. Uh, we like honest feedback. Um, it's a very good seminar, I think, and hopefully the, the feedback will reflect that. Um, there are some more future events rushing upon us. Uh, Capital on the 10th of December. Moibus, if you're interested in VCTs, or in, indeed what VCT managers are investing in, that's a good one. Um, Myriad, uh, that's a fascinating company as well, and it's doing very well. Uh, Woodford, sad case of Woodford, the Woodford campaign, and now the claim with Lee Day, we're having a briefing session on that. Um, and that'd be fascinating. And then a nice cosy chat by the fire with our patron, Lord Lee, um, and Liam Boris and David Streather in January. Please attend those. And uh, move to the next slide. If you're still interested in Lloyds Bank, and I am very much so, uh, there's a Signet meeting, uh, which you've got details of. You can join at 10 past set. 10 past 12. Uh, Douglas and Carla won't be there, so we are we'll in private chat about uh, what we think of Lloyd's. So thank you again, um, Carla and Douglas, for engaging with individual shareholders in this way. Um, and if only we could give you a pop-up warm round of applause. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you.